Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming to our virtual open house. Uh, my name is John Morrow, and I'm a professor of material science and engineering uh, here at Penn State, also the chair of our graduate program. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now and go into presentation mode. Um, one second here. All right, ready to get started. Um, welcome to our virtual open house. Um, so what I would like to do today is, um, first of all, give you an overview of our graduate program in material science and engineering at Penn State. Um, then I'm going to turn this over to several of our students and faculty members uh, to discuss um, one slide overviews, brief overviews, of um, research in various areas uh, here at Penn State. So structural materials uh, by Dr. Bisi, uh, computational materials um, with by Sierra Chandler, one of our PhD students, soft matter by Dr. Sinha, one of our, our newest faculty members, and electronic and optical materials by Dr. John Paul Maria. Um, from there, we will go into a virtual lab tour. So you will get to see um, Stido building and then get a 3D tour of some of our labs here. Dr. Maria will be giving that tour. Uh, then we've got a really nice presentation by three of our current PhD students, Jensen, Shaley, and Jess. Uh, we'll be talking about life in State College. Uh, after that, uh, we're going to break out into discussion rooms and everyone can self-select uh, which breakout room you would like to go in. You can move between different breakout rooms if you wish. Um, the first three are by topic area. So the first breakout room is in organic materials. So if you're interested in uh, polymers or other organic materials, please go into that room and you'll have a chance to meet with current students and faculty members in that area. If you're interested in inorganic materials, uh, go into the second room. Uh, computational materials for those of you who are interested in computer simulations. And then um, the next breakout room is for student life. Uh, this is no faculty allowed, just students talking about what it's like to be a student here in State College and what it's like living here. And then uh, I'm going to remain in this general room together with uh, Haley and Sue, and we're going to answer any general questions that you have about the program or about the admission process. And then all of this will wrap up at five o'clock Eastern time. Um, so to get started, uh, let me go back to the title slide and just point out something about our graduate program that makes it special here at Penn State, and that is um, it is an inter-college graduate degree program. And what this means is it's kind of an acknowledgement of the fact that material science and engineering is a very interdisciplinary field. We build a lot on chemistry and physics, various types of engineering, uh, math, computational studies, and so on. And it all intersects here in material science and engineering. And so our graduate program uh, reflects that. Uh, by being an inter-college program, what that means is that all of the faculty members who are within our Department of Material Science and Engineering are a part of our graduate program, but we also have about another 50 or so faculty members from other departments who do research in materials and are appointed to our graduate program. So these are professors in physics and chemistry, chemical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, and so on. Um, professors who are doing research and materials and are able to advise master's and PhD students in material science and engineering. So as prospective students in our program, you'd have the option to be advised either by a faculty member from within our department or any other faculty member who's appointed to our graduate program, uh, but happens to be in a different department. Um, here at Penn State, we um, believe in, in tearing down these walls that normally exist between departments and just make it as fluid as possible uh, for our students. Um, the other thing I'll point out here at the beginning is that Penn State is a powerhouse in materials research. So um, the National Science Foundation ranks um, 
research programs at universities in terms of the uh, amount of dollars that are spent in each field. And now for the fourth year in a row, Penn State ranks as number one in material science um, in the United States and number two in materials engineering. Um, this is reflective of um, the very broad deep and diverse uh, set of expertise that we have here at Penn State and just about any type of material that you would want to study. So if, if you're coming to Penn State, it's not only a, a wonderful environment to do research and have a, a collegial uh, experience with students and, and um, professors, it's also um, one of the, the top programs in the country and the world. Um, why Penn State for graduate studies in material science? Um, beyond our top ranked program in material science and engineering, uh, it's a very large and interdisciplinary program. We have either the largest or second largest graduate program in material science in the country uh, with about 210 current graduate students, uh, most of whom are PhD students. A uh, very diverse set of faculty advisors, about 80 faculty advisors are available to you. About 30 of those are within our Department of Material Science and Engineering, and about 50 are outside the um, department. Uh, we also have outstanding uh, research facilities. These are um, actually the best research facilities that I have seen in any of my own travels to dozens of different universities across um, the country and across the world. Um, this is one of our buildings that uh, I'll be talking a little bit about, our Millennium Science Complex, um, and just uh, amazing facilities for doing material synthesis and characterization. Uh, we also have a very wide variety of courses that you can select from. Um, so for your elective courses, you could choose uh, various material science and engineering courses, but you also have the option to take graduate level courses from other related departments like chemistry, chemical engineering, physics, electrical engineering, and so on. And if you want to see the full list of courses, you can go to Penn State's uh, bulletin here, which lists all of the graduate courses and all of these programs. Um, so who uh, is running the program? I'm the chair, faculty chair of the program. Um, and my home department is here in material science and engineering. Uh, we have a co-chair for our program, who's a professor coming from a different department, and that is Dr. Patrick Lenahan, who is from Engineering Science and Mechanics. And we have two wonderful graduate program coordinators uh, who are here as part of this virtual open house, uh, Sue Hyde and Haley Barnes. Um, they take care of um, all of the logistical questions and issues about um, you know, applications and anything that you may need while you are a student here. Um, during the breakout room sessions, uh, Sue, Haley, and I uh, will all be staying in the general room. And so any general questions that you have related to our graduate program, the application process, and so on, uh, please feel free to stay in that general room and ask us there. And then you can join in, in one of the um, other rooms. Um, now, most of you are probably here as interested in our PhD program. Um, by the way, one of the questions that I often get is, should you apply directly to the PhD program or apply to the master's program first? Um, if your intent is to get a PhD, I would strongly encourage you to apply directly to the PhD program. Um, that would be the, the better path um, towards getting into the program and towards pursuing your goal of, of getting a PhD. Um, for our PhD program, this requires a minimum of 30 uh, graduate credits. Um, that includes three required courses. These are our core courses that everyone needs to take. Um, in the first semester, in the fall semester, you would take um, Thermodynamics of Materials, which is MATC 501. Uh, that is taught by Professor Dabo, who is an absolutely outstanding uh, lecturer, teacher, person, researcher, uh, wonderful guy all around. Um, and you'll be getting thermodynamics from him in that first semester. Um, then in the spring semester, you'll be taking kinetics of materials processes. Uh, that's the class that I teach. 
and you'll be doing Matt C 512, which is Principles of Crystal Chemistry, taught by uh, Dr. Susan Trollier McKinstry, who, again, is just a, a phenomenal uh, researcher and teacher, and she's written the textbook for this course, and it's just a, an amazing experience to be a part of, of that course. Um, each semester, you will also sign up for one credit of colloquium. Um, this is where we bring external speakers to campus and give uh, roughly weekly talks. And you'll need to do that each semester that you are enrolled here in our program. Um, there's also a one credit hour course called Professional Development. That is this Matt C 582 class um, that you would take in your first fall semester. And that is taught by Dr. Susan Sinnott, who is our department chair. And this covers a lot of uh, practical topics for uh, being successful in graduate school and in your career. It covers professional ethics, intellectual property, publishing, conferences, um, all of this uh, useful information for succeeding in the field. Uh, beyond this, there are, are an additional nine credits, so that's three courses that are required um, as electives. So these would be three additional 500-level uh, courses that you would take, either from our material science and engineering program or from an adjacent field like I've already mentioned. Uh, my advice would be to talk with your advisor to see which courses would be the most helpful uh, for your own growth and development and the most helpful for your research. Um, beyond the course requirements, the other requirements um, beyond your research are these three uh, what are called benchmark exams. Uh, after your first 12 to 18 months uh, in our program, you take the qualifying exam. Um, the qualifying exam is a test of your uh, basic knowledge of material science and engineering and your ability to apply that knowledge uh, towards uh, developing a hypothesis related to um, your research. Then a year after that, um, you would take your comprehensive exam and the comprehensive exam uh, is a chance for you to uh, present the research that you've done up to that point in your PhD. So this is roughly the first two or two and a half years and uh, get feedback from your PhD committee and also uh, discuss the plan for the second half of your PhD. Then at the very end, you'll have your final dissertation. This involves writing your, your written thesis document as well as presenting that in front of your committee. And if you do all of this, then uh, you get your PhD in hand and then you can move on with the next stages of your career. Um, in addition to all of the formal coursework and research, we also have uh, a very strong network here at Penn State to help support your professional development. Um, for example, if you uh, may want to become a faculty member in the future, if, if you'd like to teach in the future, uh, you are welcome to volunteer as a teaching assistant for a, a course that would be of interest. Uh, we do not require any of our students to teach or to become TAs in order to graduate. Uh, so this would be something that, um, you know, if you're interested in doing it, uh, we will make it happen, uh, but you're not required to do so. So if you desire your teaching experience to further your career goals, we'll make it happen. Just ask. Um, we also have awards for conference travel. Um, you know, a key part of the graduate student experience is having opportunities to present your research. And we have a, a variety of funds that are available to help with uh, paying for conference travel. Uh, we also have a very active uh, chapter of the Materials Research Society, MRS. Uh, in fact, the Materials Research Society was originally founded here at Penn State, um, and it still has one of the most active chapters. And they do um, not only a lot of great professional development, but a lot of wonderful social activities as well. Uh, for example, this past weekend, they took a trip to New York City and they, they checked out a couple of great museums there. Uh, so it's a wonderful way to, to meet people, to get engaged with the community, and to help with your professional development. Uh, also in our department, we have an external advisory board, which consists of uh, some of the graduates from our program who have been gone on and had very successful careers in industry or academia or the national labs. And we've got a board of about a dozen or so um, of these alumni who come to campus twice a year to uh, see how our progress is. 
um, on everything that we're doing and also give us advice. So uh, this there's also wonderful opportunities for students to uh, meet with the external advisory board and to um, interact with them. Now, a few words about the admissions process. The uh, admissions uh, window is open now, so you are welcome to uh, submit your application to our graduate program anytime from now through um, the beginning of January. I do recommend that you get uh, this in earlier rather than later, um, because the earlier that we receive your application, the earlier that we can review it, the earlier I can send it to faculty members who may be interested in hiring you. So please, um, you know, get your application materials in um, as soon as you are able. Um, and one thing that I should note is that students are admitted into the program uh, based on a combination of your application materials and the, avail the availability of assisted ship funds. Uh, so when we admit you into our PhD program, um, that is with um, a promise of funding to pay for your tuition, as well as to pay for a stipend to, um, to cover all of your living expenses here in State College. Um, and so there is a, a bit of a matchmaking process involved with that because professors will have openings uh, in different uh, research areas, depending upon where they have funding, and they are looking for uh, students who would specifically be good fits um, for, for their projects. So the uh, lesson is get your application materials in as soon as possible, because the sooner we get them in, the sooner we can um, start that process to see who would be a good fit. Um, and the decision on advisors, in our case, is made before your arrival on campus. And so you will already know um, who your advisor is and which group you will be in uh, prior to your arrival on campus. And that's just a, a much better process to ensure that you're going to find a good fit in terms of the research project that you're doing for your PhD, um, a good fit with your advisor uh, in terms of having that working relationship. And then when you arrive on campus, you can hit the ground running with that. Um, a few words on our graduate assistantships. So we cover uh, both uh, a stipend and tuition for your PhD. Um, and we also uh, provide very good insurance here through Penn State uh, that covers both uh, health insurance, dental insurance, and vision insurance. Uh, Penn State covers 80% of the premium. Um, this shows you the costs for uh, 2022 per year for health insurance, dental insurance, and vision insurance. And there is a web page here where you can go for more information. And just a word of caution too, when you consider uh, offers from different universities, um, be sure to factor in uh, the very uh, different cost of living in different areas, different cost of health insurance and so on, uh, because it is a, a lot more cost effective to live in an area uh, like State College compared to say uh, the Boston area or the Silicon Valley area. Um, now, uh, a word about some of our facilities. Uh, our department is spread across two uh, main buildings here on campus. Uh, one of them is this amazing building called the Millennium Science Complex. Um, this is a relatively new building um, that uh, cost a, about a quarter of a billion dollars to build. And it is um, kind of a, a jaw-dropping building. I, I couldn't believe it the first time I saw it because it looks almost like a spaceship ready to take off. Um, and this is home to our Materials Research Institute, or MRI. Uh, the Materials Research Institute is a um, very big uh, multidisciplinary education and, and innovation center for materials that, just like our graduate program, is designed to cut across the traditional barriers between departments and colleges. So any of the faculty members who do research in materials at Penn State, regardless of the department that they're in, uh, can become affiliated with the Materials Research Institute. Um, they have um, these weekly cafes that you can go to to learn about each other's research. They have um, amazing facilities for uh, doing, especially characterization. So um, below this beautiful uh, Japanese garden shown here, there are 15 rooms underground that are designed to be as isolated as possible from any type of mechanical or electrical disturbance. That's where we have our um, 
TEMs, our SEMs, our um, a really wide selection of characterization equipment housed uh, underground there as part of uh, what we call our materials characterization laboratory. And we have not only the equipment there, we also have a staff of about 30 um, scientists who are experts in each of those pieces of characterization equipment. And so, you know, they are here um, to partner with you on research, to, to partner with you as uh, problem solvers, and to help teach you how to um, use all of that equipment. Uh, now, our Materials Research Institute uh, cuts across five different colleges here on campus. Um, there's our own college, the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, and also covers the College of Engineering, uh, the College of Sciences, College of Agriculture, and one other college that I can't remember right now. Uh, that includes 15 different departments, over 200 faculty members, uh, 100 additional researchers, 800 graduate students, um, all affiliated with the Materials Research Institute. Um, this houses 40,000 square feet of quiet labs that are shielded from um, electrical and vibrational disturbances. Uh, also a 10,000 square foot uh, class 1,100 clean room and 4,000 square feet of collaborative space. So it's, it's really um, an amazing facility. As I mentioned, it's not just the equipment, but also the people. Um, this is all fully staffed by just a, a wonderful group of um, outstanding scientists who are, are very um, knowledgeable and passionate about the uh, areas of materials and materials characterization that they're involved with. They very actively uh, want to work together um, to partner with you as problem solvers. Um, and this includes our materials characterization laboratories, our nanofabrication laboratories, um, as well as a variety of other um, material synthesis and characterization labs. And if you're able to, um, to come to campus in our in-person open house in February, um, then you'll be able to see some of this in person. Now, the other half of our faculty members are located in this building. This is the Steidel building. This is where I have my office. And this building was originally built back in 1929. And you can see the original uh, facade here in the front. It's a, a beautifully designed um, building. Uh, but it was completely renovated um, on the, the uh, inside as well as uh, the back of the outside here and then reopened in 2016. And so even though you see this older facade here on the exterior, uh, inside it's all completely new, uh, all completely new as of 2016. There are, um, our department offices are here, our student computer lab is in this building, uh, many conference rooms uh, and student common areas that are very comfortable for social events. Um, we often hold department social events here in the Steidel building and the laboratories are amazing too. So there are uh, three floors of these uh, shared laboratory spaces that all have uh, these beautiful glass windows so you can see inside and um, you know, make sure everyone is working uh, safely in the labs. Um, the Steidel laboratories cover everything from undergraduate teaching through advanced processing, mechanical testing, 3D printing, nanoparticles, polymers, rheometry, uh, a glass melting lab, thermal properties, as well as a computational lab. And I mentioned safety, but this is something I really want to emphasize because uh, Penn State has an outstanding safety culture. It, it is the best that I've seen at any university um, by far. And this is something that we take very seriously because um, A, we don't want anyone to get hurt, obviously, uh, but B, this is also outstanding preparation for your future career because any, any company that hires you is going to expect you to have um, good knowledge of safety and understand uh, safe laboratory practices. And, and Penn State does an outstanding job of uh, not only teaching these good safety practices, but living it in our day-to-day um, -day research. Uh, beyond experiments, we also have um, probably the, the largest, most diverse set of faculty uh, working on computational materials science. Uh, we've got experts who work at all scales of computational materials. For example, uh, Dr. Dabo and Dr. Sofo are two of the world's leading experts, and Dr. Janik too, and Dr. Crespi and, and Dr. Jensen uh, on uh, electronic level modeling and simulation of materials. Uh, moving up to the classical level, 
Audrey Van Dune is the creator of React's FF potentials for reactive simulations. Susan Sinnott is another one of the world's leading experts in that area. Uh, Christian Fichthorn is the inventor of the Kinetic Monte Carlo technique. Uh, Zikwe Lo is the president of CalFOD and the world's leading expert in computational thermodynamics. And uh, Dr. Chen is the world's leading expert in um, phase field modeling and calculating the evolution of, of microstructure, of materials microstructure. Um, but across all of these scales, we've got uh, world-leading experts. So if you're interested in modeling and simulation, uh, pretty much anything that you'd be interested in would be available here at Penn State. Uh, now to look at some of our research expenditures, um, Penn State actually has well over a billion dollars of annual research expenditures across the university. Um, you can see some of this data trending up through uh, 2018. Um, going into recent years, it has gone up over a billion dollars uh, per year. Uh, about half of that, or a little over half of that, comes from uh, federal government support, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and so on. Uh, the remainder comes from uh, non-federal support, uh, so that includes industrial support, um, also subcontracts, and um, state support. Uh, Penn State is also known for uh, being very industrially friendly. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come here to Penn State, um, is that we are you know, well known as one of the uh, the friendliest universities for companies to come and work with uh, because of our combination of outstanding faculty, students, research facilities, and also the ability to um, have good contracts uh, made between companies and uh, Penn State. Uh, so with that, I'm going to um, I'm going to hold any questions until we go to the breakout rooms. Um, and then I'll answer any of the questions at that point in time. Uh, for right now, I'm going to stop sharing and um, I'll turn this over to Dr. BC. I think if I stop sharing, uh, Heather is able to make that switch, right? Yeah, let me, I can try it out. All right. So. Um, so I'm going to talk about structural materials. I'm just getting the slide up now. <clears throat> okay. So you should be able to see this. Um, yes. Okay, great. So yeah, so in structural materials, so we do a lot of work um, here at Penn State in the material science department and beyond. So I'm just showing some of the <clears throat> sort of core faculty that work in this area as well as their, their uh, areas of interest. Um, so in, in what I do wanna emphasize is that we do a lot of work with both experiments and computational modeling. So that is wrapped up in this slide as well. So Tara Sankar de Broy is sort of a pioneer in numerical modeling for welding. Um, and that translates also to additive manufacturing. So his group does a lot of work in computational modeling of, of the heat and mass flow during welding and additive manufacturing. And then that will give information for how microstructures develop. Uh, Ho Jung Kim, his group works on electrochemical processes. So they look at different length scales and experiments uh, primarily to try to characterize the, those, those processes. These have applications to separation of metals as well as recycling and corrosion. So they do a lot of work in all of those areas. Darren Pagan uh, does work in advanced manufacturing and he does some really cutting edge research in terms of in situ mechanical testing. Um, he's a pioneer in the field of high energy X-ray diffraction microscopy methods and has and worked prior to Penn State at uh, Chess, which is a beam line, a single time beam line. Um, so his group works a lot in, in that space as well and they continue to do um, experiments there. So they do work in the characterization of microstructures, as well as the modeling of how the microstructures impact on the mechanical behavior, as well as a lot of work in the area of machine learning and data analytics. Arthur Mata is in the nuclear engineering department, and his group works on materials for nuclear power, doing a lot of experiments, um, also teaming often with Idaho National Lab to do experiments on nuclear materials to understand how they evolve uh, during, during use. Todd Palmer is um, also working in the area of additive manufacturing and welding. So his group does 
primarily experiment uh, to look at how um, the processing parameters during additive manufacturing and welding impact things like the microstructure of the phases and the, the properties of those materials. Doug Wolf um, works in on the area of uh, uh, several different areas, but a lot in high temperature materials. So he does a lot of work in coatings and ultra high temperature ceramics, things that have um, applications to hypersonics and refractory metal alloys and, and composites. So his group does a lot of advanced fabrication as well as experimental characterization of those components. And then in my group, um, we do work in the area of multi-scale experiments and computational uh, mechanics. So we're interested in looking at how microstructures of materials impact their mechanical behavior. And we do a lot of work in the area of additive manufacturing. So also, I just want to put in um, sort of a highlight in terms of structural materials on our additive manufacturing center at Penn State, which is SIM 3D. Um, and in this facility, we have techniques for fabricating um, metal components with, with um, powder bed type of processes, as well as directed energy de uh, deposition processes. And so we fabricate metals and ceramics and polymers at SIM 3D and characterize then um, how the unique processing that they see impacts their structure and properties. Um, so any of these areas, we're, we're all online um, on the website. You can reach out to us. Uh, many of us are here to talk um, in the structural materials breakout room today, um, and we're happy to answer any questions. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. PC. Um, next up is Sierra. Can you hear me? Yes. Amazing. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, for the lack of not wanting to repeat information that's already been presented, I will go very quickly um, over some general topics. Dr. Marl already shared uh, the Materials Computation Center um, and all of the various faculty that are part of this center. Uh, this is actually um, oriented in a uh, scale as we inc go increasingly in uh, size um, and, and, and I go from micro scale to macro scale. And each of these professors work with uh, and along these um, scale. Um, I actually work for Ismael Lidago. So I work with DFT. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. But uh, I, I apologize for the lack of detail <laughs> uh, for each specific professor provided here. But again, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, computational method development um, in each of this uh, materials computational center. Uh, so whatever material, like Dr. Morrow said, that you're interested or property or synthesis or whatever that you're interested at, at whatever scale, uh, you could find that these professors are working on it within their respective groups. Um, just a bit more um, about my group, because uh, talk about it. I'm a part of, again, Dr. Dabo's group, which is the Materials Optimization and Simulation by Ab Initio Computation. So we use density functional theory and um, Ab Initio molecular dynamics and a little bit of molecular dynamics and other computational um, uh, methods to look at various energy uh, sustainability uh, projects. So that can include ferroelectrics for energy efficient uh, uh, microelectronics, um, catalysis for electric chemical energy conversion, um, semiconductors for solar energy conversion, um, and uh, again, under microelectronics like high entropy oxides. And most, if not all of these projects uh, have experimental collaborators. Um, and we work a lot with other groups, uh, experimental groups in, um, in uh, our department and across other departments too. And that's very common across all of the uh, other computational um, groups in that uh, group, computational group that we mentioned earlier. So do you have any questions? Uh, I apologize that I didn't share that now, uh, but if you have any questions about any computational um, research group and what collaborations would look like. If you would like to be co-advised, if you wanted to experiment in computation, what that would look like in our department, please let me know. Um, yeah, that's it. 
Great, thank you, uh, Sierra. Um, so yeah, one of our uh, rooms will be computational materials. So if you've got questions for Sierra, you can um, go into that room. Uh, next up is Dr. Sinha. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of polymers and soft materials. I think I made more than one slide, so please bear with me, but it's a short presentation. Um, so in Penn State, uh, in the material science and engineering department, we in the there's a lot of research that's being done with polymeric soft materials. And the general ideas that we try to think about are how to make polymers of the next generation smarter, smaller, and more sustainable. And um, it, it spans many different types of materials, right? Like composites and blends and colloidal nanoparticles and biomaterials and biomimetic polymers, as I have uh, tried to show here on this slide. But there are um, obviously um, a lot of uh, intersection in these areas where um, some groups work on making polymers smarter and smaller, whereas some groups work on uh, making the uh, polymers more sustainable as well as making composites and blends out of it. Well, essentially what um, uh, techniques that we use in all of these uh, groups come down to the two Ps and the two Cs of polymer research, which spans processing, physics, characterization, and chemistry. Um, and so um, a lot of the research groups in Penn State in the material science and engineering department that work with uh, polymeric soft materials are actively using all of these uh, techniques to make uh, new polymer materials. So um, some of the professors um, and PIs that work in these fields are uh, listed on these slides. Uh, in the polymer nanocomposites uh, field, we have Professor Nutifafa Dumont, who works on next generation photovoltaic and optoelectronic technologies. There is Professor Enrique Gomez, who works on complex soft materials and assembly and characterization of these materials, as well as Professor Clive Randall, who works on dielectric and piezoelectrics, which also uses polymers. Um, there are some more faculty in this field. There is Professor Robert Hickey. He works on hierarchical self-assembly of hybrid inorganic polymeric nanocomposites for a host of different applications. There is um, uh, Professor Evangelos Menias, who works on high-performance uh, polymers, especially um, using inorganic uh, and polymer nanocomposites, as well as Professor Ching Wang, who works on ferroelectrics and polymer nanocomposites for um, optoelectronic and electronic properties uh, and applications. In the field of polymeric biomaterials, we have world-renowned um, scientists like Professor Dupanjan Ban, who works on immune nanomedicine, drug delivery, and biosensor applications and uses a lot of polymer um, in, in these types of applications. Uh, Professor Urara Hasegawa, who uh, works with polymer nanoparticles as biosensors for reactive oxygen species and gas transmitters, as well as myself. Um, and I work on self-assembly and processing of biomimetic polymers and biopolymers for a host of different applications. Then there is finally also, um, we have a world-renowned polymer physicist in our department, Professor Ralph Colby, uh, who um, studies polymer physics and processing of polymers, as well as with uh, Professor Wesley Reinhardt, who is more on the molecular simulations and computational techniques for soft materials, if you want to reach out to him. And also Professor Carlos Lop Lopez. He is a new professor who's joining in January next year, and he's going to be working on polyelectrolytes, uh, polyionic liquids, and, and um, specifically using rheology and light scattering techniques. So um, I still want to just shout out um, to um, the facilities and centers at Penn State. We have the Materials Research Institute and the Huck Institute of Life Sciences that have a host of different characterization techniques that we as soft matter scientists use very routinely. And you as graduate students in our department will um, get to use as well as learn from um, their research staff, which I think is very important for um, graduate students um, to grow as researchers. And so, yeah, if you have any more questions on any of the other polymer science um, fields and research areas, please feel free to contact me or any of the uh, professors that I've listed here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Sinha. 
Um, let's see. I think next we go to uh, Jensen, right? Perfect. All right. Okay, so I definitely have way more than one slide. I'm not talking about really any of the science. I'm doing kind of a life in state college. So it's a pretty uh, comprehensive presentation on lots of different things you can do. And okay, did that share with everyone? Yes, looks good. Perfect. Okay, so yes, um, for those of you who are in Pennsylvania, you might already know where State College is. Uh, for others interested in applying from outside of the state, you maybe looked on a map and kind of saw that uh, State College is in central Pennsylvania. And um, a lot of people kind of assume, I guess, that it's in the middle of nowhere, so there's nothing to do. Um, I'm here to argue that that's very much not the case. And it's kind of all about whatever you are able to like interact with, I guess. State college is whatever you want to make of it. There's lots of things to get involved with. So here we go. Um, oops, I guess it doesn't want to let me use my keyboard. So first I wanted to kind of start more internally within the department and then expand out more into the university and then the area on the whole. So within just the MAPSI department, as Dr. Morrow mentioned, there are things that called the Millennium Science Cafe as well as the Seidel Cafes. So those are kind of a conjunction of um, like academic and social events. Typically there's someone kind of giving a talk at the Millennium Cafes. And then there's kind of a social component as well since everyone's gathering. Um, the Stadio Cafes are a little bit more of a kind of social acti um, activity where there's usually a coffee and donuts and just kind of a moment to chat with everyone in the building. Otherwise the department pretty much puts on at least like some sort of monthly event at the start of the fall semester, there's always like the annual MAPC get together picnic. So all the new members can kind of interact with people who are here. And then there's also things like the ice cream social. Um, recently we had a chili cook off. And then also within the research groups themselves, a lot of people tend to host their own kind of group outings. So you can interact with your lab mates in a more social setting. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to click through some of these. So you can see some of the flyers for those events as well. Um, beyond the department, there is also events at the College of EMS as well as the grad school. So within the College of EMS, um, they participate in what's called the Night at the Museum. There's a bunch of museums on campus that um, I think once per semester maybe, they do kind of a, a, the Night at the Museum where they just ex extend their hours to allow people to come in past 5 p.m. and the um, Earth and Mineral Sciences Museum uh, participates in that. Um, there's also other departments in EMS, I believe geosciences and geography host a coffee hour, which is similar to our Millennium and Seidel cafes. So it's a chance to kind of interact with scientists outside of MAPSI, but still in um, our college. And then at the grad school level, um, between the start of the fall semester and to mid September, they have what's called the welcome month. So they put on a variety of events that are both kind of a mix of social and academic as well as like career development. So they'll also kind of help you interact with other grad students and give you help on things like resume building or like how to access resources at UHS and a variety of things like that. Um, and then there's also a graduate and professional student association that puts on a lot of uh, social events. Um, I wanted to highlight the Winter Gala because that's one of my favorite events. Also because um, I'm going to shamelessly plug it, but I got um, a bunch of my friends to vote for me for best dress. So uh, this outfit here got me a free hat. Thank you, GPSA. Um, otherwise, here's a large group of Nazi members that all um, attended together at the formal last year. So um, kind of outside our specific department at the University of the Whole, there's loads of Penn State clubs. Um, there's a basically a student a website called Student Org Central, where you can access all of the different clubs. Um, there's over 950 throughout the university. There are only 80 specifically tailored to graduate students, but many of the undergrad organizations don't like disclude grad students. But all of these clubs have a wide range of interests and in kind of what their club is centered around, whether that's academics or socials, um, music, sports, and whether you know you have different nationalities, different spiritualities, or you're looking for th things that are involved with philanthropy and politics. So I highlighted just a couple here. 
Um, as again, Dr. Murrow mentioned, um, oopsie daisy, Oop, there's a little sneak peek of what's coming next. Um, there is a Penn State um, chapter of the Materials Research Society. Um, we also have another um, club that kind of stemmed out of some members from MATC that I think is now a little bit more broad, but there's a science policy club that obviously, as the name implies, advocates for a lot of science policy and they do a lot of um, communication and, and interaction with a lot of um, legislative le legislation at both like the state level and national level. So they do a trip to DC. Um, otherwise, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different um, clubs focused around national um, your nationality. So I highlighted a few such as like the Korean um, Student Alliance and the Pakistani Student Association. Um, below you can see there's um, a Lion Pride Club for students um, in the LGBTQIA community. Um, there's a club for Latin women in science. Actually, I put, this is Latin women in grad school of any sort of field. And then there's specifically also a grad graduate women in science. And then there's a variety of just, again, social clubs, whether you like coffee or anime or outdoors activities. So those are kind of all the clubs if you, you can get involved with if you're interested in kind of some of those topics without so much the structure, the organization. Um, there's a loads to do around campus. So here is just kind of an outline of where our campus is. I highlighted here, um, this is actually the MSC building. Um, I don't know if I actually have a laser on. Let me turn the laser on. Uh, this higher star is the MSC building and this lower star is the Steidl building. Um, so we have a kind of a area um, associated with like the athletics and the campus recreation. So we have pretty much every sport you could think of, baseball, hockey, soccer, football, track and field, tennis. If those are things that you want to watch, we have varsity sports and club sports for all of those that you can attend their games. Pretty much all of the athletics on campus are free to students except for men's hockey, men's basketball, and football, but everything else you can just go in with your student ID. Um, if those are sports that you want to play in, um, Campus Rec has an intramural league, which has all of those things, plus some like bonus fun ones. I recently saw they had like at the pool, there was like a battleship game where essentially you like you had a team of three people in a canoe and you're trying to like sink the other people's boats. So that was pretty fun. But um, otherwise, um, as regarding campus recreation, also there is the intramural building that has a lot of like fitness classes. So you can use the gym kind of on your own or you can sign up for a class where they'll help you help guide you through like yoga or oh I can't like I don't know, I think they have like even like a Tai Chi class maybe. So there's a lot of like activities through Campus Rec um, or there's like free access to the pools during like open swim hours. Um, if you wanna go to Pagula Rink, there's like open ice skating. And I wanna say, I think that's kind of lots of the things. Again, if you have more questions, I might be missing something. I'll be kind of in the social breakout room to help answer anything you might specifically be looking for. But if you're not so much um, an athletic sports person, there is also um, a lot of just kind of greenery areas. I think you can kind of tell here and the map in the main area of campus obviously is a lot of the academic buildings. We have a lot, a lot of large open space as well. Um, one that I wanted to highlight here is uh, the Arboretum. As you can see, um, this is a little beautiful fountain here. Um, basically, it's just a great outdoor space to kind of hang out in. They have a like a succulent garden area, and they also added um, like a bee, like a wild flower and bee pollinator area. So it's a great place, to just kind of yeah, to find some space to relax outside for a little bit. Um, in addition to that, there's also a large um, support for the different variety of arts. Um, so there is the music buildings as well as the performing arts centers. So they obviously host things like performances for the bands and the orchestras and those you can get involved in with like as a grad student. Um, and then so you can either again kind of in the same way as sports you can either try you can basically play in any of the bands 
or help try to like get involved in the musicals and the theater productions or you can always just attend as an audience member. So they host a lot of different performances. Um, some that have re recently been featured is the Las Cafeterias. It's a Latino uh, band. And they also did a production of Kinky Boots and are hosting a tribute to um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On the bottom right here is a picture from the Arts and Crafts Center. So that's a basically, as you can tell, an arts and crafts center. Um, so basically it's tailored to like student engagement. So they offer art classes and things like drawing and painting as well as pottery, stained glass. Um, I think they have crocheting. So they have a lot of activities as well that they have classes that run throughout the semester. If you're not um, able to commit to like a full semester class, they also have kind of like one-off events for either like lunchtime sessions or um, every Friday at the hub, they give out like take home kits that have maybe some sort of like water coloring kit or like I, this last week, I think they gave out like pumpkin carvings. So they gave you a pumpkin and then like the tool to just carve a pumpkin. But yeah, so clearly there's lots to do on campus. If that wasn't enough, there's also loads to do off campus. So in the kind of downtown and greater state college area, uh, the first thing that I wanted to highlight is um, our local public library. I also just want to say wherever you may end up, you should definitely support your public library and get a public library card open. Whether you use it or not, it's definitely good to support your community and just like a simple, easy way to get a library card. But um, beyond that, um, again, kind of more in the outdoor recreation and fitness, um, there is a place called Climb Nittany that has, that's a bouldering facility, as well as a like top rope climbing gym um, that I know a lot of students, especially in the Matsey department, um, uh, regularly visit there. You can also, um, the Center Region Parks and Rec Association also hosts a lot of events. Um, they do have a lot of like adult programs. You no, know, typically, I well, maybe not typically, sometimes people kind of associate Parks and Rec with like children's events, but they also host a lot of adult programs. So I play volleyball and soccer through the Center County Parks Department. And there's also a, a group called the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau that they basically just help um, organize events to get people together, whether it's like going caving or going on hikes together, or I don't know, I think they do camping trips together. So they do a lot of like outdoorsy activities and kind of help support people looking for information on where to do things. Um, there's also kind of regular, I guess, well, not regular, um, city events, I guess, larger events hosted by a state college. So on the top left, they have an event called Wing Fest. So every Thursday through the summer at uh, Tessie Mountain, a bunch of the local restaurants like compete in a chicken wing contest so you can attend try them and vote for your favorite and they continue to like move on throughout the rest of the summer uh three dots is an event space downtown that often hosts events and they'll do like the pew street shutdown where they have vendors come in um and then another big event in state college is the central pennsylvania festival of the arts or people just call it arts fest and uh, in the summer, for about a week, they shut down uh, one of the main roads in downtown, as well as go up through a couple of the promenades on campus. And they just have loads and loads and loads of art vendors of all different types of arts for, for ceramics and jewelry and handbags and paintings, whatever you could possibly want in the arts world they have. And kind of more production of um, the arts. Um, but we also have a, basically a State College Community Theater, as well as the Happy Valley Improv Troupe. So those are things, again, you can get involved in or go see shows and productions from, especially the Happy Valley. They offer the improv group. If it's something you have no idea what, like, what it's about and you just want to try, I know they're very welcome to just like hosting classes and having newcomers kind of try it out. And I think if you contact them, they'll even give you a free ticket to one of their shows. Um, we also have a place called The Rivet. I think this is sort of kind of unknown even to current students. It's fairly new. They tried to open during COVID and unfortunately basically shut right back down. 
since then they've reopened and it's a community like makerspace. So they have a full ceramic studio, a full metal shop and basically a wood shop. So if you go there, you have to take like a safety and training class to work with all of their tools. And then you can build whatever you're interested in, whether it's for art or for function, whether it's like furniture, you can basically make go make a chair there if you wanted to. <laughs> so that's a really cool space. And there's also this SKIP group, which stands for State College Young Professionals. If you're interested in meeting people kind of outside the department, um, as it has it's young professionals in the area. So you'll meet a lot of local, local state college um, folks, as well as a few grad students I know are in this group as well. But again, they kind of just host social gatherings to get young professionals out and meeting each other. And I just wanted to highlight kind of to summarize all of this, um, one of the local media groups, WPSU, hosts um, a site with basically a local community calendar that is kind of a local space to find a bunch of activities from and events held from all of these different groups. Um, so that, I wanted to kind of feature some of the things that are unique to State College um, that we have to offer. Additionally, I just wanted to kind of clarify that we also have what I'm calling, quote, the basics that I think are popular in a lot of towns. Um, we have kind of a pottery painting studio called 2000 Degrees. We have a bowling alley. We have laser tag. We have the movie theaters and a trampoline park. Um, if you're looking, again, for more outdoor activities, we have disc golf, regular golf, mini golf, whatever kind of golf you like, we got. <laughs> And there's also obviously lots of orchards for apple and pumpkin picking. You can see a group of some of the MRS group did a pumpkin carving event together. And there's also just loads and loads of hiking and camping options. So that's one of the perks of quote unquote being in the middle of nowhere is that we have a lot of land and really um, great um, natural places, natural resources and things in this area. Um, one I wanted to highlight is Shavers Creek um, environmental um, Education Center. Um, this is actually associated with Penn State, and they also have the um, Queensburg Aviary. So I just want to highlight that's kind of a cool little thing and show you some of their cute little guests that they have there. <laughs> um, otherwise, again, kind of for the basics in the daily life things you'll need, there's loads of bars and restaurants kind of feature like localized right in downtown State College, um, which is adjacent to campus. So it's an easy walking distance from either Steidl or MSC if you wanna grab a quick lunch or you meet up with your friends for dinner. Um, there's also lots of kind of local shopping, whether you're interested in local boutiques or we have this fun Goblin game store, there's local bookstores, um, local like um, outdoors uh, stores, I guess, for it's called Appalachian Outdoors. So they have all the gear you're gonna need for your fun hiking outings. Um, otherwise, we have the large Target and Walmart and the large like grocery stores like Giant, Aldi, Trader Joe's, things like that. There's also a couple um, um, international markets and there's also an Asian market. So if you're looking kind of more specifically for um, different ingredients, you can pretty much find them anywhere or you are able to find them here. And then I just want to feature a couple like salons and things. Um, there's a bunch of local or Kind of chain options and then again i just wanted to kind of give you a resource to find a lot of these kind of daily basics in one place um the state college magazine which is a local magazine every year um features actually this month on their november issue they post a best of state college where they basically rank based on locals voting the best bars restaurants shopping centers salons and then maybe not so relevant to kind of grad students, but also like the best local like electricians and like plumbers and things like all that. So you can find pretty much anything you need kind of in this local spot. And then as far as commuting, it is a somewhat heavily like um, car dependent city, um, but there is also uh, the CATA bus system that can help you get to campus or you can use um, the campus parking passes as well as once you're kind of around campus and down and or downtown, there's a lot of the um, rental spin bikes and it's super walkable kind of around campus. 
So then in kind of the last section, I wanted to branch outside of kind of the state college, city of state college and focus on kind of the Happy Valley area. So this is region, this region got the name Happy Valley, I guess some of the, the lore of where the name came from is that even during the Great Depression, people still enjoyed living here. And because they were so pro prosperous off the farmland, again, not entirely sure the accuracy of that, but to this day, Happy Valley um, is a common standing of this area. So as I mentioned, we're located right in central Pennsylvania in Center County is this kind of weird structure shape we have here is our county we're in. So if we zoom in, um, we are actually so look right here located in State College. We have a bunch of cute little nearby towns um, such as Belfont and Bullsburg that have even more op options for like dining and shopping and just little areas to visit. Um, this park right here in Belfont actually also off, um, hosts a lot of fun events, whether they have their summer kind of arts fest as well, or they have like a winter holiday market. In addition, we actually have the Ross Rock State Forest, which is a lot of places um, have um, a great place to do a lot of the hiking that I've mentioned. And here is where you'll find the um, Shavers Creek Nature Center, which is where the aviary was. They also have a large lake if you are interested in things like kayaking or paddle boarding. Um, there is a rental spot for those there. Um, a little bit to the northeast of us, there's also Bald Eagle State Park. It has a bit of a larger lake with a beach there if you want to do kind of swimming, lounging there. And then to the southeast of us, there's Tessie Mountain, which is where I mentioned that the Wing Fest activity um, was hosted. Um, but it is still a ski mountain as well in the winter time. And then in the summer, they have kind of a adventure park area with like the mini golf, um, go karting, and like batting cages. So lots of things to do at Tessie Mountain as well. They also host a like um, marathon like ultra marathon, I think it's an, or like Ironman kind of situation. Um, so that's lots to do there. And then lastly, I just wanted to kind of feature that, again, one of the bonuses of being in um, surrounded by a lot, of, a lot of farmland is we have a large um, agro-tourism kind of in the area. So there's a lots, lots of um, vineyards and wineries as well as breweries and distilleries in the area. So if you're interested in kind of exploring the central Pennsylvania area more while getting a nice drink, there's a thing called the Tasting Trail uh, Passport that you can essentially get kind of perks and bonuses at each place you visit. And then if that wasn't enough for you, there's also lots of places surrounding us in the mid-Atlantic region. If you want to take a little weekend trip or even a day trip, um, lots of major cities are within um, a few hours drive of us. Um, to the east, we have New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and DC. You can see some of our uh, MATSI members uh, outside the White House, as well as this last weekend, the MRS took their arts trip to New York City and visited the Met. Um, to the west, we have Pittsburgh and Cleveland, so you can get uh, to a Pirates game if you're interested in baseball. And more to the north, you can also visit uh, Niagara Falls and or if you have your passport, hit up uh, Canada and check out Toronto. So that was kind of all I had for you guys. I hope that was helpful information and not overwhelming. Um, if it was maybe overwhelming, you need a little bit of clarification or you have questions, I'll again be in the breakout room with uh, Jeff and Shaylee as well to help kind of answer any questions. So thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, great. Let me turn this over to Dr. Maria. All right. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. My name is John Paul. Um, I'm a member of the faculty here. I've been at Penn State for a little over five years, and I'm going to um, do two sort of brief presentations here. One will be a, a virtual tour of our, say the material science home base, which is Steidel Building. You've seen a few photographs of it already, but we have some 3D 
um, tours that we can walk you through so you can get a feel for the, um, the layout at our home base. And then I'm going to talk for about 10 or so minutes about a summary, a very broad summary of electronic, optical, and magnetic materials research that happens within our department, uh, as well as uh, a few specific examples of research that happens in, um, in our group specifically. So we'll start with the tour. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the front entrance of Steidel Building. Um, and if you, um, we're on Pollock Road, so it's kind of in the center of campus. It's in one of the older parts of uh, Penn State's campus. And, you know, if you look down, you can see you know, tree line streets on Pollock Road. This is sort of the start or the, the center of um, the old older part of campus is an area where there's lots of uh, classrooms uh, and dorms across the street. Um, Seidel Building was built in 1929. It's been remodeled a few times. Most recently it was remodeled, I think, in between 2014 and 2016. So while the building looks uh, quite old and classic on the outside, it is actually brand new and streamlined on the inside. So if we walk up the stairs and look now uh, outside of Steidel, right? That's what you'll see when you come into our department. And if we go in the building, you'll see again. You know, it looks quite old from the outside, but on the inside, it's been completely remodeled and renovated. And it's really a, a wonderful facility. Um, there's laboratories on three floors and an open atrium in the center of the building. And, and there's, I think there's 12 or 14 faculty that share uh, laboratories uh, in Steidel Building. Right? The home office or the department office is situated in this corner of the building. Whoops, over here. And then uh, much of the administrative staff um, sort of sit on this wing of the building. So we'll take a little walk down one of our hallways and into one of our labs. So there's the laboratory areas are separated from the office areas. There are um, doors so that only uh, graduate students or other laboratory users can access this space. So all the laboratories are about 7,000 square feet in Steidel uh, inside these doors. And all of the student offices are sitting on either side of the laboratories. So we can give you an example of where you might be sitting if you came to grad school at Penn State. So we have nice sunny offices where everyone um, will have a desk. So this uh, office area here is shared by um, our group, uh, shared by Dr. Adair's group, as well as a few people from Dr. Priya's group. Okay. Each office area is equipped with a small kitchenette for lunches or little meetings. And then the laboratories are you know, inside these doors. So we're gonna show, so, show off some of the shared spaces because I think that's what's most interesting. So let me move to the top floor. Okay. Okay. So the top view of the fourth floor, we can see one of our favorite conference rooms up here. So you might be giving your thesis defense in this room in about four years uh, if you decide to come to Penn State. Uh, but group meetings, seminar speakers are often using this space. We also have events here. Our Seidel Cafe is often held in this room. Um, we have lots of meeting space in, in the department, which is very nice. A uh, nice, more formal conference room here. Again, for group meetings or hosting visitors. Again, it's a really, uh, really uh, nice building and we're uh, very lucky to have access to this nice uh, modern space. Um, if we go into the third floor, I wanna highlight here, again, same floor plan. This is just right above the, the entrance. So basically student and faculty offices on the outside of the building and 
All experimental facilities are in the interior. Um, every floor does have a similar uh, meeting room. So typically you'll have group meetings or host visitors uh, in these areas, and each one is equipped also um, with a small kitchenette for having lunches. So again, all very nice uh, modern space that we have uh, to access here at Penn State. Okay, so the bottom floor is shown here. We have a large computer laboratory on the bottom floor, and then one large classroom on the inside that seats about 70 people. That's um, basically managed by the university. But again, a center atrium where we hold some events uh, throughout the year. And then this area here is where we have undergraduate laboratories. Right, but again, it's a nice modern space, airy, open, a really nice uh, nice place to uh, to be. So as I mentioned, there are multiple faculty um, in Seidel Building. We'll just tour a couple of laboratories. I'm going to show here. John, I hope you don't mind. But we'll take a look into uh, one of your glass laboratories. So Dr. Morrow, um, obviously, we... I'll recognize him as one of the preeminent glass scientists in the United States. And this is one of the laboratories where he does a lot of glass melting and fiber, and fiber spinning, as well as formulation development. Right. One thing that I want to focus on is that uh, in Steidl, we have a really serious commitment to safety. And as you'll see, all the laboratories are, we do our best to keep them neat, keep them safe, um, lots of ventilation, um, plenty of infrastructure for handling all of the experiments that we do safely, um, chemical storage, um, ventilation, power, water. Uh, it's all state-of-the-art facilities that we are <clears throat> ensured that not only can we do really say state-of-the-art research, but we can do it uh, completely uh, comfortably uh, and safely. Okay. So we can take a quick look into Dr. Beasy's lab area. So the, the large labs, again, this is the center of the first or the, the ground entrance floor laboratory. Each of them is roughly 7,500 square feet. And each of them is shared by anywhere from three to probably four or five uh, faculty members. Oh, the labs are nice and open. It's a nice environment where we share the space. There's always, almost always somebody in the laboratory. So that also addresses you know, some of safety concerns. Again, lots of uh, ventilation, uh, well-lit, lots of power, lots of cooling water, everything that we need to do to conduct our research. This is some equipment in Dr. Beasy's group that is um, largely focused on the mechanical behavior of materials. And then we can take a quick look at the laboratories that our group uses. So we are a vacuum science group and we have a lot of deposition tools and a lot of characterization tools that we use right, to study, for the most part, electronic materials. But this tour, besides making you maybe a little bit dizzy, should give you an idea of the types of spaces that are available here in our department and the working environment that you are likely to experience uh, if you decide uh, to join us. Okay, so that's enough for tours. Let me now move on to a just a brief discussion of electronic materials at Penn State. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'll talk here about just in very broad terms, the electronic, optical, and magnetic materials research that's happening uh, at, at Penn State. And it's specific to our department, although there's many other groups across campus that participate in materials, in the broader materials research community. 
So as you can see, this list here are all of the people who I'll say specifically specialize in electronic, optical, or magnetic materials. Uh, there are other groups that uh, that also do some electronic materials that I, I'll not I'll miss here, but these are the individuals who claim it as their kind of uh, core competency. So there are people here colored with three different backgrounds. Uh, those uh, in red are individuals that are largely focused on uh, the analysis or the measurement or the characterization of materials. Uh, in green are people who focus more so on the theory or computational approaches to electronic, optical, and magnetic materials. And then in blue are individuals that focus more on um, specialization in synthesis and, and fabrication. So about one third of our faculty falls into um, this category. It's a um, an area of excellence that our department has been involved in for for quite a few for quite a long while. Historically, we have been a very strong department in um, in dielectric materials, in electroceramic materials, and that started all the way back in the 1930s and 40s. And then over the years, we've branched out into all the types of materials that you can see here. Uh, we have a number of large centers that bring together this cohort of people uh, into uh, very powerful teams that are doing some really state-of-the-art art, art research. <clears throat> uh, so I'll just say, for example, Dr. Chen uh, specializes and, and really leads the field in multi-scale modeling using phase field approaches. And his group is routinely doing outstanding work in the prediction of materials and the behaviors um, in ferroelectric materials or those materials that have a strong nonlinear um, dielectric properties. Uh, Venkat Gopalan, who's I think here today, <clears throat> runs a group uh, largely looking at the optical properties of materials, specifically um, how they react to um, very fast um, laser beams, uh, as well as looking at materials for um, studying their quantum behavior. Uh, then uh, Josh Robinson and Joe Renwing have um, really leading efforts in two-dimensional materials. So Penn State has become a real strong leader nationwide in all things 2D. And there's a couple of centers here that you probably heard a little bit about or will hear so more about in the um, breakout sessions <clears throat> where we have very large teams looking at the fabrication of 2D materials, the theory behind or underpinning their properties, uh, as well as um, um, very interesting methods to, to characterize them. Um, Stephanie Law, who joined our uh, department just a few years ago, brings uh, new expertise in molecular beam ap molecular beam epitaxy of classical 3-5 semiconductors with a focus on uh, quantum materials and nanophotonics. And Clive Randall's group, who has longstanding historical research in, in electroceramics and, and defect chemistry. So really, everywhere from, from dielectrics to 2D to quantum materials to semiconductor contacts to first principles calculations to advanced microscopy, we cover a very <clears throat> broad area of research in electronic materials uh, overall. So I show here some of the you know, specific areas of interest where our department has been uh, very strong uh, recently. Again, I mentioned uh, next generation electronics are, um, there's, there's great hope and rightfully so that next generation electronics will happen in two dimensions. So whether you're talking about um, thin intercalated one and two atomic layer thick la layers of metals that are being made in Josh Robinson's and uh, Joan Ridwing's laboratories <clears throat> or transition metal chalcogenides, which are very interesting for planar two dimensional electronics. Um, there's two centers here. One is um, funded directly by the NSF. One is an industry consortium that brings together probably altogether 20 or 30 faculty um, that are focusing on these areas. And again, in the areas of characterization, in um, directions of synthesis, <clears throat> and from the perspective of, of theory. Multifunctional ceramics, uh, thin films, and crystals has been an area of historic expertise at Penn State. Uh, whether we're talking about formulations for high permittivity multilayer capacitors, theories that help us predict the phase behavior of ferroelectric materials, um, high-end characterization methods to locally map out the polarization of ferroelectrics at the scale of atoms, <clears throat> or 
thinking about the uh, interaction of domain walls uh, with light or plasmonic interactions between infrared light and uh, free carriers and semiconductors, there's a, a very large area or expertise er set in, in this area. Energy storage, energy harvesting, and energy transduction is an important, let's say, research activity in our group or in our department these days. Um, Dr. McKinstry's group is very interested in using piezoelectric elements to accomplish this transduction. <clears throat> and there's a long history of bulk single crystals with very interesting novel formulations that you know, are really outstanding performers uh, in these technology spaces. And I think one area that in electronic materials where Penn State really shines is the dedication to really making materials and characterizing them well. We have absolutely beautiful laboratories for thin film deposition, for chemical vapor phase deposition, for molecular beam epitaxy preparation, <clears throat> and for really outstanding high resolution characterization tools so that we can understand what we make at the scale, at the length scale of, of atoms. So there's a lot happening in these in, in electronic materials at Penn State. So I'll just take a few minutes and introduce um, some of the activities in, in my group. Uh, we like to work on novel ferroelectrics. Uh, we like to work on materials that have high configurational entropy, uh, novel quantum materials, infrared plasmonics, ultra hard materials, and uh, indeed just the, the science of vacuum and the science of synthesis. It's near, near and dear uh, to, uh, to my heart. But one thing that I want to uh, make a point of, of, um, of saying is that you know, if you were to you know, think about working with our group in any of these areas, you're not just working with, with our group. So this is the set of people just from the department uh, that have funded, collaborated, funded collaborative projects uh, with, with my research group. So, and it's, it's something that's very important at Penn State. There's a lot of collaboration within our department and without our department. So no matter if you work with Dr. Gopalan or Dr. Lem or Dr. Sinnott or Dr. McKinstry or Dr. Randall, you're very likely to be on a project that involves one or two or three other faculty in our department. So you're gonna get exposure to you know, uh, an area that's much bigger than just you know, what your faculty advisor represents. And it's a real strength of, of, of Penn State. The collaboration here is outstanding and it leads to a much richer graduate experience uh, no matter whose group uh, that you that you join. So I'll just very briefly talk about two areas that um, that we're working in. Uh, number one is in the area of novel ferroelectrics. So one thing that our group has been doing, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about it, is looking for materials beyond perovskites. So those of you who are familiar with ferroelectricity know that things like barium titanate and PZT are sort of the classics that inspire a lot of our thinking. But very recently, uh, a number of groups, ours at Penn State and another group in Germany, demonstrated that some of the wort sites like aluminum nitride can be compositionally modified to induce a, a new ferroelectric phase. And there's a large center here called 3D FEM, funded by the DOE, that's looking at uh, the possibilities for these materials. That's led by Dr. Trollier McKinstry. And it's a huge area of activity uh, on our campus. And it, again, it handles the measurement of these materials, the fabrication of the materials and the theoretical understanding of, of how we make them and how we understand them. So that's one area. Um, we have developed a number of instruments to prepare these materials in very nice uniform fashion, as I'm showing here. Um, so again, a, a, a nice area for that put Penn State on the map because of the large cohort that we have um, developed uh, to explore them. Okay. One other area, that um, we have another large center activity um, focusing on is the area of materials with um, high entropy or materials where we can put many cations on a single sub lattice. So I'm showing here an instrument in our lab that makes these five component borides. Um, these are interesting materials because they have the possibility of having extreme high hardness values. Uh, we're trying to develop materials that are have a hardness value that's similar to uh, cubic boron nitride. So at Penn State, there are two groups, uh, our group and uh, Dr. Wolf's group working together in these areas. And really what we're trying to do is develop new materials for the Navy 
so that they can more efficiently uh, repair their fleets without taking them uh, into dry dock. So you know, basic scientific research, how does formulation and entropy and structure influence hardness that leads to you know, materials of societal value. So new, ma new materials that help us uh, join metal plates uh, by friction stir welding uh, to solve some very practical uh, Department of Defense needs. Okay, so yes, uh, I hope that um, you'll feel free to stop by in the breakout sessions and, and talk to us about the work that we're doing. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Maria.